my name is David Burks. I am a senior account manager at Expedient. Uh, we're obviously sponsoring the room today. We're very happy to be here and be part of uh, a great partnership we have with the Tech Council. Um, I'll keep this one a little shorter since most of you have already heard it. Uh, Expedient, if you don't know, is uh, we own 11 data centers in seven cities. We're doing an awful lot with infrastructure as a service along with traditional co-location co and networks. Um, we, uh, out of the 11 data centers we have, we're all interconnected with 100 gig private fiber networks for incredible speed and data transfer between those data centers. Uh, our big products currently are all uh, based on infrastructure as a service, um, from hosting, cloud hosting, to disaster recovery as a service. And as you heard in the last talk, we're getting uh, very involved in multi-cloud. It is a reality. It's the way everything is going. So being able to uh, connect with and operate within uh, and with these other clouds is uh, vitally important to how people are looking at um, structuring their organizations and structuring their data. So I'll leave it at that for now, and I would like to introduce Aaron Gustafson from Duolingo. Hello. Um, so my name is Aaron Gustafson, and I'm a data scientist at Duolingo, uh, which is a learning link or language learning platform that was founded and developed right here in Pittsburgh. Um, and I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing since we were founded six years ago, uh, using data to improve language learning. But first, I'll tell you a little bit about Duolingo. Um, so Duolingo was, uh, it started as a uh, research project at CMU, and we um, launched officially to the public in 2012. We have more than 300 million students uh, all over the world uh, who are taking uh, more than 80 courses with more on the way. Um, our mission is to provide free language education to the world, which means that all of our learning content is completely free. So who are our students? Um, as I already mentioned, our students span the entire globe. We have hobbyist learners who use Duolingo rather than playing mobile games, uh, recent immigrants to the United States who are learning English, refugees in Sweden learning Swedish, and Trekkies learning Klingon. Um, additionally, Duolingo is actively involved in attempts to preserve endangered languages like Irish and Hawaiian. Our challenge is to provide high quality language education to all of our learners while preserving a mission to keep education free. And this can be somewhat of a challenge sometimes given sort of the diversity of backgrounds that our learners have. So Duolingo has steadily grown in, its, in popularity since its launch in 2012. This plot shows data from Google Trends comparing search query traffic uh, for Duolingo and its main competitors, such as Rosetta Stone and Babbel. Duolingo has been a data-driven company since its inception. But you'll notice uh, an inflection point uh, in Duolingo's popularity starting around the time we began using machine learning and natural language processing methods for our product development. We've seen enormous growth in our popularity since that time. Today I'll be walking you through some data-driven projects at Duolingo that had the goal of improving language learning. Uh, but I'd like to start by addressing an important question. Um, as we develop products that we think improve language learning, how do we even know that we've succeeded? So the answer to this question is the learning quiz. Uh, the learning quiz is a language assessment tool that was developed in-house by our learning experts. It was designed to directly assess knowledge of vocabulary, grammar, reading, and listening with a pool of beginning, intermediate, and advanced questions. Learners have the option to take this lightweight five-question quiz every two weeks. It's a natural extension of the typical Duolingo session experience, and learners can even earn extra XP for completing the quiz. So although five questions isn't really enough to tell us something about an individual learner and how well they're learning, by averaging across learners, we're able to get a pretty good sense for how well we're teaching. We begin the quiz by asking learners to self-report their prior proficiency in the language that they're learning. This allows us to build a more comprehensive um, understanding of how well we're teaching all of our learners. Our goal for Duolingo is for Duolingo to provide an engaging and effective learning experience um, for everyone, regardless of how much prior proficiency they had before they began using Duolingo. And the learning quiz is an important part of achieving this goal. So 
Here's some data. Um, this is an example of some data from the learning quiz. Uh, this is from uh, learners in our English course for Spanish speakers, and this data comes from August of this year. So this plot shows you how learners at different stages of proficiency perform on the learning quiz as a function of how much time they've been using Duolingo and the difficulty of the question that they were answering. So I'm showing you mean accuracy on the quiz on the y-axis and in, an, in, sorry, an index of progress through the Duolingo course on the x-axis. Each panel of the plot indicates the, the difficulty of the question, and each line represents the prior proficiency of the learner. So you'll not, notice a couple of things in this data. First, you'll see that as the questions become more advanced, so moving through the panels, accuracy gets worse. So this is good validation that we've designed the quiz well. You'll also see that as learners progress through their Duolingo course, moving uh, from left to right on the x-axis, accuracy gradually increases, regardless of the difficulty of the questions, which is great. So this means that Duolingo is actually teaching well. Um, and that's true regardless um, Sorry, getting ahead of myself. So yeah, it's teaching well in that the more that learners are using Duolingo, the better they actually do on the quiz. Um, so also notice how this, the quiz scores vary by prior proficiency. So learners who report higher levels of prior proficiency do better on the quiz, regardless of how hard the question is. You should notice too that the learning quiz scores improve with course progress regardless of prior proficiency. So this tells us that Duolingo doesn't just work well for the beginning students who have never studied the language before, it actually teaches beginning and advanced students well alike. So insights like these from the learning quiz are invaluable for our team of learning experts who can develop changes to our existing courses uh, to improve learning outcomes for some or all populations of learners. Um, so the learning quiz is relatively new at Duolingo, but from the beginning, we've had systems in place that try to provide the best learning experience possible for all of our students. An early example of this is strength meters that remind students when to practice. You see these outlined in red on a Duolingo skill tree. The meters indicate to the learner that it's been a while since they learned or practiced a particular skill, such as French gerunds, and that it might be time for a refresher. The strength meter algorithm also serves learners with a personalized set of weakest words that they uh, would benefit most from practicing. All of these recommendations are based on a statistical model of word strength in long-term memory. And we use this model to provide each student with a personalized learning experience. This model was inspired by insights from psychological theories of learning and memory that I'll walk you through right now. So an important theory of learning for our student modeling is the spacing effect. The spacing effect is a classic finding that learning is more effective when the student space is studying out over time rather than trying to learn everything at once. So basically, learning is better when you don't cram. Um, furthermore, learning is even more effective when you gradually increase the spacing between studying. So we want our student models to be able to capture both of these effects. But you might be wondering, how do we even know what the right spacing is? And for that, we turn to something called the forgetting curve. The forgetting curve characterizes how memory retention declines over time. One of the key features of the forgetting curve is that the strength of newly learned information, such as a newly learned word in a foreign language, decays in memory over time. The half-life of a word in a student's memory indicates the time since last practice where a student has a 50-50 chance of remembering the word. In this example, the student has nearly 100% chance of recalling the new word after no time has passed since they last practiced it. The half-life of the word occurs after about one unit of time in this example. So at this point, the student has a 50-50 chance of correctly recalling the word. After too much time has passed, after about six units of time, the student has probably forgotten the word. The original Duolingo student model was based on the Leitner Adaptive Flashcard System, which makes use of the spacing and lag effects. The schematic here lays out uh, the general idea behind the Leitner system. If a student correctly remembers a flashcard after one day, it graduates to the two-day box and then the four-day box and so on. But if on day four the student can't remember the card, it gets demoted to the day two box. Uh, the Leitner system does follow the spacing and lag effects that we know are good for learning, but our students actually complained that this model didn't accurately capture what they had learned um, and didn't suggest well what they should practice next. So to improve on this original model, um, researchers at Duolingo considered whether we could build a model based on data from past practice sessions. For example, consider what we can learn about 
um, about a learner and what they know based on three different sessions where they were practicing this sentence, being a child, he is small in French. Each of these sessions and the errors that students make in the sessions provide rich information about what the student does and does not know about the language that they're learning. And this information serves as input to this new half-life regression model for uh, student modeling. The input to the model um, is vectors like x, which summarize a student's experience with a word in a given session on Duolingo, where p is the recall rate, or the proportion of times the word was correctly recalled in a, in a session. Delta is the lag time, uh, the amount of time that's passed since the student last encountered a word. And x is a feature vector that summarizes a student's practice history with a particular word, so across sessions. This includes information like the total number of times they've gotten the word correctly, answered or recalled the word correctly or incorrectly, um, as well as some linguistic information specific to the word. Together, this information is input into the half-life regression model. And the task here is to predict forgetting curves for each word in a student's memory. Oh, there's a little typo, sorry. Um, after training the new half-life regression model, the Duolingo research team collected two weeks of log data from Duolingo, which consisted of practice session history for 12.9 million sessions. Um, they compared three categories of spaced repetition algorithms. So this new half-life regression model, the original Duolingo student model, which is based on the Leitner system, and an off-the-shelf logistic regression. Um, the team measured the quality of predictions made by each system using the mean absolute error of predictions. So on the plot, you're going to see the systems along the x-axis and mean absolute error along the y-axis. And keep in mind that the, the goal here is to reduce error. So shorter bars mean better systems. So you'll notice in this data that the half-life regression model has about half of the error. The, the error rate is about half of that of the Leitner system meaning that the new Duolingo student model is a huge improvement over the original model. So even though the error data showed that the half-life regression model was an improvement, we wanted to put it in front of our, our learners to make sure they actually responded positively to the change. So we ran a series of A-B tests to see how they responded. So in one A-B test, um, we compared the original Leitner student model with the half-life regression model. We ran the experiment for six weeks with one million Duolingo users. At the end of the experiment, we saw a small but significant increase in the proportion of users who used Duolingo one day and returned the following day, indicating that the new student model improved learner engagement. Additional iterations on the model uh, led to even bigger gains for our engagement metrics, and so we launched the updated model to all of our learners. Um, but the work didn't end there. So this work was presented by our research director at the um, Association, Association for Computational Linguistics conference in 2016. And we had a lot of feedback from the research community after that about ways that we could improve the model. So the original, original iterations of the model use something like an exponential forgetting function to represent decay for students' memory of, of newly learned words. So the next thing we did was ran a series of, or ran one experiment uh, with a series of different forgetting functions. Um, that have been discussed in the literature, such as a power logarithmic, logarithmic functions. So what we found was that the original half-life regression forgetting function, which is shown on the left, um, was better for most of our engagement metrics. On top of that, by the time we ran this A-B test, we had developed the learning quiz. So for the first time, we were actually able to evaluate the impact of different versions of our student model on learning outcomes. And what we saw was that the original version of the student model was substantially better for learning than models with different forgetting curves. Interestingly, we saw that the conditions with positive impacts on user retention took the biggest hit on the learning quiz, which suggests that there's some sort of trade-off here between user engagement and learning effectiveness. So at this point, we seem to be hitting diminishing returns on how much we can improve the half-life of regression model. So instead, we started thinking about ways that we could improve user engagement and learning effectiveness together. So we noticed that the current model, which drove the skill strength meters, was ultimately a punitive reward system. This, the longer a learner uses Duolingo, the more their skills decay, and it becomes harder and harder to both learn new content and keep your tree gold by practicing old skills. So regilding your trees also um, requires that you repeat the same exercises over and over, which can become really boring. 
As an alternative, we came up with a totally new user experience called Crown Levels. Oops, sorry. Um, the main crux of the redesign was to provide learners with a positive reward system. So rather than trying to keep skills gold by repeating exercises, we served learners with more difficult exercises over time for a single skill. And this way, the learners can review material that they've already learned, but the exercises are unique and they become more difficult over time. So the next step was to figure out ways to actually classify our exercise types in terms of difficulty, to rank them in terms of difficulty. So to do this, members of our research team performed an item response analysis using a large amount of student session data, specifically focusing on the effects of different exercise types. This analysis revealed varying difficulty of our different, different exercise formats. Specifically, we saw that exercises that require only passive recognition of the foreign language, such as matching a picture with a foreign word to a, a native word, uh, were much easier for learners than exercises where learners actually have to actively produce the language without any assistance. So using these insights, we implemented our new crown levels experience by changing the distribution of exercise formats that our learners see as they progress through five different levels for a given skill. So learners will be more, li more likely to see easier exercise types in early skills and more difficult exercise types in later skills. We hypothesized that this experience would improve user engagement and also learning outcomes. Because in the past, we had found that presenting learners with um, difficult exercise types and difficult, difficult content was actually harmful for engagement, which sort of makes sense if you're presented with difficult material earn, early in the learning experience, it could be really demotivating. So with this crown levels change, we were able to ease learners into increasingly more difficult exercise types, um, which also meant that we could unlock a whole bunch of content that we just weren't using before because it was too hard. So we ran another A-B test to see how our learners responded to this change as well. So here we, were, we compared the original tried and true strength meters, which used the half-life regression model, to our new crown levels experience. We had 1.3 million users in this experiment that we ran for a whopping 15 weeks, and the results were really staggering. So we saw significant improvements in user retention, and the improvements actually increased over time. So this crown levels change had a huge impact on long-term learner retention. It was one of the biggest wins for a Duolingo experiment in the history of the company. A nice consequence of this new experience is that learners spend 50% more of their time reviewing old content rather than learning new content. So learners are, are motivated to level up their skills and practice old content in increasingly difficult contexts. Given that learners are spending well over the majority of their time practicing old content, we wondered about the impact of this on uh, learning outcomes. So do learners um, in the crown levels experience actually perform better on the learning quiz than learners who had the strength meters? And the answer is yes. So we saw a 2.4% increase in learning quiz accuracy in this experiment. So now we have um, launched crown levels to all of our learners on all of our platforms. And as we continue to experiment with improving this experience, the Duolingo research team is thinking about ways that we can reintegrate spaced repetition, which is what the original Duolingo student model did, um, into the crown levels experience. We've also been thinking about ways to move beyond the word-based student modeling that we've done in the past to incorporate richer information about linguistic structure as well as more detailed information about a learner's history with a word. To that end, uh, members of the Duolingo research team recently organized a shared task that was co-located with a computational linguistics conference. We provided participants with 7 million sessions from 6,000 users in their first 30 days using Duolingo. And the systems submitted by the 15 teams offered insight into the best way to predict future mistakes made by learners based on their history of past mistakes. The learnings from this shared task and the A-B tests that we continue to run every day will inform future efforts by a Duolingo team to improve our student modeling and offer our learners an even more engaging and effective learning experience on Duolingo. And that's all I've got, thank you.